Welcome everyone to the third installment of our webinar series featuring Dante King, Anti-Blackness and its link to racism, power, and privilege. My name is Lanisha, I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Director of Multicultural Affairs within the Office of Diversity and Outreach. I want to acknowledge our partners in uh, cre co-creating this event, and I want to acknowledge Melissa Bautista, Assistant Director for the Multicultural Resource Center, Benjamin Wallen, our wonderful uh, tech support uh, from ETS services within UCSF, and just a broader recognition and acknowledgement to the Office of Diversity and Outreach and the leadership of Vice Chancellor Dr. Renee Navarro. We are going to get started in just a moment. I'm going to let folks uh, filter into the room and I will start soon with a welcome and an introduction, introduction to Mr. Dante King. All right, so it looks like our numbers have kind of stabilized here. So I would love to introduce our UCSF community one more time to Mr. Dante King. This is the third of four installments in a webinar series that he um, developed and was so gracious in sharing with our campus community. As we know, the events in the spring of 2020 and summer of 2020 have been the most enduring at the intersections of COVID-19 ongoing anti-Black racism, structural oppression, and all types of personal lived experiences uh, being touched. Uh, so we know that this message is more uh, powerful than ever, and we're so grateful to have Dante King. So Dante is a native of San Francisco. He's a workforce learning and organizational development professional specializing in the implementation of equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice, implicit bias, educational training, and he has more than 15 years of experience. Throughout his career, he has gained expertise in designing, developing, and delivering a combination of retreats, classes, and seminars. And again, we are so one, so grateful uh, and thankful to have you with us today. Dante, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you, Greater UCSF community, for having me back. Um, so as Dr. Hill mentioned, I do a lot of work in organizational development uh, and capacity building specifically, um, more recently in anti-racism work. And so I'm going to be sharing some pieces uh, with all of you that I pulled together from a, a larger curriculum and capacity building um, exercise that I use with organizations um, that's framed under the guise of understanding the, the roots um, uh, and functionality of racism on various levels, uh, his, um, institutional racism, cultural racism, systemic, systematic um, racism. And so I'll be walking through a brief introduction for those of you who might be new to this. Um, but thank you again for joining. So um, you, if you have any questions for me uh, personally, if you want to reach out to me, I can be reached at Dante at DanteKing.com. Um, again, that's Dante at DanteKing.com. You can go to my website at DanteKing.com. Uh, but really, um, my purpose and my goal for doing the work that I do is, is liberation, um, really liberating um, everyone as many people as I can, <laughs> uh, specifically black and brown people though, through education, uh, through a process that I and others have begun to refer to within, I would say the recent last two decades or, and maybe even before, but decolonization, decolonizing the mind, decolonizing the, um, our thought processes and learning how to uh, reframe things. And so um, in looking at the various ways in which racism functions as a brief introduction, um, framing it as um, race prejudice, uh, favorable and, and or unfavorable, um, plus uh, social and institutional power. So fa favorable race prejudice, plus social and institutional power. Um, it's a system of social, political, economic, cultural advantage and power. Um, and also those same um, elements and components uh, of oppression and powerlessness. So systems of social, political, economic, cultural oppression and powerlessness based on race 
Um, it's a white supremacy system in our cultural context and also a system of anti-blackness, which I've developed a definition for that I'll share with you in a moment. It relies on um, really powerful institutional cultural mechanisms to be able to function and have as much uh, validity and, and real, real realization as, as, it, as it has, um, such as capitalism, and really the ability to incentivize and provide people with their value or something of value based on their so what has been determined sociologically. Um, so it perpetuates white power and privilege and non-white powerlessness and oppression. Um, racism does not work without representation in numbers and it does not work without the ability to control and manipulate and design every element of culture. Um, and so I'm gonna walk through some of that with you today. Um, so notably assimilation, um, although that's seen as something good uh, to become a, an American citizen or realized as a citizen, um, it's also, that's also a tool of racism. And so I emphasized this the last time um, in episode or, or the, the second part of the series, but Gloria Ladson Billings, along with William Tate in a paper that they actually wrote together, um, emphasized this notion that whiteness is the main property value that, Ameri that white people have um, and that they own. And that um, the United States was founded on, on the notion of property rights with infrastructures, um, our governments to protect them. Um, and so, race specifically um, and whiteness as a property has significantly infinite value and it provides all these rights right and i named some of them a moment ago but really the right to privilege comfort the right to safety uh, the right to participate in a system of economics which is really a system of socialism built for white people um, the right to housing the right to innocence the right to entitlement uh, the right to the benefit of the doubt to the bodies of non-white people, particularly pre predominantly black people, um, all black people and other non-white people uh, through slavery and beyond. And we see nowadays, even with the recent murders of um, Ahmaud Arbery, we can go to Botham Jean, um, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, uh, Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd, and all of these um, situations that were very minute and minuscule in terms of the reasons why they may have been approached by law enforcement, and yet they were murdered and executed. So it's kind of the right to murder without consequence, the right to surveil, the right to exist, um, and really the right to exist without any interrogation. And so when we look at the notion of anti-blackness, anti-blackness is a cultural condition developed through um, collective European colonialist ideas, beliefs, ideals, and ideologies that black and brown people of African descent are inferior, animalistic, and barbaric um, in North America, particularly uh, the United States. Anti-blackness is the underlying foundational principle of racism. And I think that's really important to note um, for the, the basis of the discussions that I've held previously or presentations that I've done, as well as what I'm gonna share with you today. Um, so the cultural ideal was established to oppress, disenfranchise, demean, invalidate, surveil, diminish, minimize, degrade, kill, and otherwise harm black and brown people of African descent mentally, emotionally, symbolically, and physically through political, economic, legal, educational, religious, and social means. Um, and so it functions um, as a culture, people who are um, acculturated, guided, indoctrinated to believe a certain way, um, and then that embed or is becomes embedded or gets embedded um, into institutions through the people who are behind the institutions, who are behind the decision making, the creation of all things. Um, and it flows through a personal level. So it's cyclical uh, because other individuals across race um, who are participants of this culture become acculturated um, in white supremacy and really are ascription to strive for thing, all things created by um, white people particularly, and also become acculturated in sensitized, if you will, in, to, in a culture that is anti-Black. And so I'm going to talk about uh, the intersections of government, um, lawmaking and policy, law, laws and policy making, law and policy making, um, academia, religion, and healthcare. 
slash health education. And really the intersection of all of these, but particularly the implications and the influence that white supremacist patriarchy and anti-blackness have had um, in all of these, um, or how they particularly, particularly impacted all of these arenas. So with that said, um, please bear with me. Um, so in pr prior talks, I've referred to uh, the Henning Statutes of Virginia. I'll refer to that briefly um, and, and then pull from some other um, sources of information. But looking at um, going to the law, the Maryland law of 1649, the um, Toleration Act, which stated that um, under this law, if anyone were to, um, and I'll just quote for a, from a few lines, deny our Savior Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, or shall deny the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Godhead of any of the said three persons of the Trinity, um, or the unity of the Godhead, or shall use or utter any reproachful speeches, words, or language concerning the Holy Trinity, or any of the said three persons, uh, that that person shall be punished with death and confiscation or forfeiture of all his or her lands and goods to the Lord Proprietary and his heirs. So we see very early on um, in this law and other such laws that were um, created and implemented in various other colonies that Christianity uh, played, just was constituted through the legal context um, as the predominantly pre predominant religion uh, of that time, of the British colonies. Um, so we see different iterations of Christianity um, through Puritan practice, um, through practices that the Quakers developed, um, and other such um, designs, if you will, or configurations of, of the religion. Um, but this is very significant to note um, because it, it really drives home that the ways in which Christianity or religion um, intersected with the law and how these things were not necessarily of choice, but that, that they were constituted. We also know that Africans during this particular period were not recognized um, under um, or could not be recognized as Christian. It was necessarily off limits against the law under English common principle. And we, you also see um, while some African people who arrived from other such places um, in Europe, that they may have been baptized as Christian, that they were allowed to be able to practice, such as in Portugal, um, in Britain, um, but it, it was not pervasive and it wasn't necessarily recognized here. So when people arrived here, they were noted in um, documents such as the Virginia Muster, uh, which is like a census document, as others not Christian in service to the English. You also see laws such as the law of 1662, which constituted that ministers must preach every Sunday um, at each chapel of ease in, in, his, in his parish and other Sundays at his parish church, and that twice a year at least he administered the sacrament of the Lord's Supper there. Um, in 1667, it became, um, they legalized Christianity uh, for black people, um, which made it because prior to uh, this law, it was noted that um, it was against the law, rather, for Christians to be enslaved. Under this new law, it allowed for slaves to be Christian, to practice Christianity, uh, particularly for the purposes of um, Negro slaves um, and some Indian slaves who they felt at the time could be uh, selected to practice Christianity and would be um, useful in helping to um, coerce, indoctrinate, gather others to uh, maybe become a part of the practice of Christianity. Uh, the thought being that it would make them fall into line, that they would fall into line under Christian practice. They also wanted to begin baptizing children, small children, and they knew that if they baptized them under the previous um, laws, that those children would be free. It, it was just kind of what was written under English common principle. Um, and so in order to ensure that all such children would follow suit under Christian principle, um, they had to create this law. 
So you see the impact of Christianity and role that it's playing in enslavement, the role that it's, in, that it's playing to indoctrinate um, not all um, English and other white people as it was noted, but also um, Indians as they were referred to and Negroes as they were referred to. Um, two prominent figures with which uh, Ibram Kendi, Dr. Ibram Kendi discusses in his book, Stamped from the, Stamped from the Beginning, were Richard Mather, um, and John Cotton, two notable clergy people um, who were two of the first prominent ministers uh, of the Puritan church in the Massachusetts Bay Colony that they upheld that African slavery was natural, normal, and holy, uh, and believed and preached uh, Aristotle doctrine that extreme hot or cold climates produce intellectually, physically, and morally inferior people who are ugly and lack the capacity for freedom or self-government. Um, a quote from Christian Hege uh, Hege Hegemony um, uh, is that Christianity blessed slavery. I thought this kind of captured the essence of what was unfolding during this time um, really succinctly, but, but almost perfectly. It says Christianity blessed slavery at every step of the trade. Uh, for example, in present day Ghana, a small church for baptizing Africans before they were taken onto ships was situated above Elmina Castle slave pens. Many of the ships had names such as Jesus, Good Ship Jesus, Angel, Grace of God, Christ the Redeemer, Blessed, John Evangelist, the Lord our Savior and Trinity, the Lord our Savior and Trinity. I'm sorry. In the early days of the slave trade, the Portuguese branded every woman. Um, on her right arm with a cross. Um, you also have it where Christian ministers are praying over the slave ships. Um, they're blessing them uh, before they set sail. Um, so these were people who believed that they were um, morally uh, accurate, affirmed in what they were doing in terms of erecting the institution of slavery, uh, but who also preached harmful doctrines, right, um, that espoused that you know, black people were not only inferior, but were animalistic, um, treacherous beasts. Um, so theories of barbarism were developed that were also preached um, through Christianity and were very pervasive and widespread. Um, and so here we have, and I'm gonna try and do this some justice, um, but the colonial colleges that are also heavily influenced and constructed by people who are members of the Christian church. Again, various um, sects of Christianity, but they, they all are. So we've got Harvard um, founded in 1636 by a clergyman, John Harvard, who was also an English minister, um, slave owner in, uh, noted in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, another example, um, not necessarily someone who is associated um, in academia, but going into the 18th century, you see um, the development of the Presbyterian Church. And uh, Francis McKimmy is a notable figure there. Um, he's often regarded as the father of the Presbyterian denomination. He played a major role in forming early congregations, organized the first American Presbytery in 1706 and contributed to the establishment of the principle of religious toleration through a notable court case in New, York, in New York the following year. He also held property in human beings. Um, so this is roughly around 1706. Um, he also held property in uh, human beings, African slave, slaves, a, a native of Donegal, Ireland. McKimi resided for some time in the British colony of Barbados, whose prosperity depended on slaves and sugar and his residence in Barbados and trade with the colony financially supported his ministerial labor in North America. McKimmy later married into a wealthy family in Acomac County on the eastern shore of Virginia, where he acquired substantial land holdings. His 1708 will also listed and ordered the distrib distrib distribution of 33 chattel slaves. Um, so this is significant because going into the 18th century, you see the evolution of various such other academic institutions. And many notable figures are uh, representatives of the Baptists, 
um, denomination, the Presbyterian denomination. Um, and so I'm going to go on. So we have Yale University um, in 1718 that uh, renamed after Elihu Yale in 1718, uh, who was the college's largest benefactor. Um, he was a clergy, um, and the college was originally established to educate congressional ministers. Um, so Elihu Yale was a British merchant, slave trader. Um, so it's found in, I'm sorry, found in 1701, sorry. Uh, by clergy originally to educate congressional ministers and then renamed in 1718 after Elihu Yale. So he's a British merchant, slave trader, trader um, president of the East India Company. Um, again, heavily uh, involved in, in slave trading. Want to emphasize that. We've got Princeton um, in the New Jersey province in 1746. So we've got Aaron Burr Sr., who's a Presbyterian minister, um, Jonathan Dickinson, who's also a Presbyterian minister, um, who becomes the, the president of the university, uh, William Tennant, uh, and then John Witherspoon, who's also noted as a founding father. They are all Presbyterian ministers. Um, and this will take on some significance in a moment, but I just am noting this before I move forward. Uh, we've got Columbia University, um, which, which was established by um, as King's College by the Royal Charter um, under King George II of Great Britain in reaction to the founding of Princeton College. Um, it was renamed Columbia College in 1784 following the American Revolution and in 1787 was placed under a private board of trustees headed by former students, um, Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, who are also two, noted as two of our founding fathers. Um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, which becomes a significant player. Um, all of these noted as Ivy League schools. Benjamin Franklin, um, noted as one of the founding fathers. Um, John Whitefield, who's also an English Anglican cleric, clergy person and evangelist. Um, also noted as one of the founding fathers. So they found University of Pennsylvania. We go to Brown in 1764, and we've got John Brown, Moses Brown, uh, and James Manning, uh, who are, who are co-founders um, that are affiliated with the Baptist Church. Um, and then we get to Rutgers University. And some very um, interesting points about Rutgers, um, founded in 1766, um, and also named after its largest benefactor, Henry Rutgers, who was a slave owner and advocate that supported the war against Native Americans, um, noted as the War of 1812. Um, so Rutgers' first president owned slaves. Um, its first tutor owned slaves. Its namesake, Henry Rutgers, owned slaves, um, including the Negro winch. Um, he supported in his will uh, a slave no named Will lease for construction, um, construction work by the New Brunswick doctor who owned him helped lay the foundation for the old Queens administration building in the early 1800s. Um, Sojourner Truth was also originally owned by uh, the family of the first Rutgers president um, and some early trustees owned slaves and were among uh, the most ardent anti-abolitionists in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, Rutgers early faculty and curriculum reinforced the racism that justified slavery and the separation of races. This is extremely profound um, because what you'll see as I move forward is that this was pervasive in terms of teaches, te teachings um, and, and theories and um, philosophies that were developed to purport uh, not only racism, but uh, a white supremacist hold or grasp on various subject areas of expertise. Um, and it also espoused um, significant anti-blackness and played a, a tremendous role in shaping um, health care uh, and health education. Um, and so uh, this book um, by Kendra Boyd, Marissa Fuentes, and Deborah Gray Wright is a great read. It talks about Rutgers University, but that last point I just want to emphasize um, being that this was pervasive throughout all of these universities, which I, which is why I'm kind of flowing through this um, trajectory and chronology of these uh, universities in terms of their evolution and also the players who were influential people who um, founded them or either were huge um, influencers. So Elazar Wheelock, 
You've got Dartmouth in 1769, uh, was an American con congregational minister, um, orator, educator uh, in Connecticut for 35 years, who was also the son of plantation owners. So a quick question for you, uh, and then I'm gonna go to a slide um, and have you answer it. But based upon um, the slides that I've shared with you so far, and some of the previous presentations that I've done, how does white supremacist patriarchy intersect with anti-blackness, genocide, uh, and erasure of indigenous peoples, religion as Christianity, and academia to impact, influence um, US culture? So I'm gonna go to this slide. And if you go to, um, in your browser, pollev.com, slash Dante King 893, you can submit answers here, but I, I do want to um, have you respond. So again, based upon what I've shared with you um, in, in the previous presentations that I've done, how does white supremacist patriarchy intersect with anti-blackness, genocide and erasure of indigenous peoples, religion as Christianity um, and academia um, and its role in really shaping um, and constructing American culture, U.S. culture as we know it. Um, because this, these, this period and the, the information I share with you, it matters tremendously. So I'll give you a second to respond. Speaking of directly. Mm -hmm. Says so the values that um, that are the basis of these systems. Absolutely. I'm not sure why this is showing up like this. The catalyst. Absolutely. They are also interwoven. And these things are foundational to and embedded in U.S. culture. Whoa. Ah. Hold on, let me back up. Yes. In every way, absolutely. Uh, white supremacist patriarchy is foundational to this country. We cannot separate the roots of this country from white supremacist patriarchy. Uh, a notion about righteous Im immorality because of the use of religion, yes. How leadership is mentored, absolutely. Uh, falling back on religion as a pardon for, for heinous ideals, oh my God, okay. So you all are getting it, because I was, I was fearful that I wouldn't have enough time to elaborate, and so I'm rushing through some of this information, but yes, um, completely baked into our cultural cake. Yep, who gets to lead? These are the rules. Yep, academia has been used to implement, justify, and replicate white supremacy. I mean, yes, and just kind of even the framework of, 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 in terms of who gets to say what knowledge is valuable and or what knowledge is, um, who gets to guide how that knowledge is presented, how people are then guided and or taught to, to think about um, information or knowledge. They all build upon one another, constituting an overall self-supporting system that aggregates power toward white patriarchy. Absolutely, why DEI is not supported. Absolutely. Um, the symbols that are part of these uh, organizations. Yep. So I'm gonna go on, um, you all get it. Um, and I want you to be thinking about like, what are some of the results, which more of the results um, in addition to what was listed there. So then we go on, uh, and I don't know if I have, if I have, will have enough time to cover this, um, but white supremacy, anti-blackness and scientific racism. So scientific racism is a pseudoscientific belief that empirical evidence exists to support or justify racism, racial inferiority or racial superiority. Historically, scientific racism received credence throughout the scientific community but it is no longer considered scientific. So uh, we see this being used in so many ways um, onward throughout the, uh, and beyond the, the 18th century, but getting 
into the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, and so I'm just going to share a few examples, some examples of this. We've got Carl Linnaeus um, in or around the early 18th century, who established that uh, Homo Americanus, uh, who he referred to, um, referring to quote unquote Indian people, as reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and governed by customs. Homo Europaeus as uh, gentle, blue-eyed, fickle, white, governed by laws. Homo Asiaticus, who he um, constituted were dignified, uh, ruled by opinion, uh, grave. Homo Affer, black people who he, who he noted as black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, careless, governed by caprice. Um, you've got John, or, I'm sorry, Johann uh, Friedrich Blumenbach, um, who was a German physician, naturalist, physiologist, and anthropologist, again, uh, credentialed to study people. Um, who was noted as one of the first to explore um, the study of the human being as an aspect of natural history. Um, he determined uh, in his own framework that uh, the Caucasian or white race um, was the most beautiful people uh, in the world, really um, noting that the Caucasian mountains, which he found were um, in his own estimation, were, were white and beautiful because of the, the their slip their uh, white slopes that they that they possessed at the time, um, that he would rename uh, the white race after um, the Caucasus Mountains. He also developed his own framework um, of the Caucasoid, uh, Africoid, mo uh, Mongoloid, uh, American, and Astroloid. Um, and then there were different um, interpretations and or characterizations or names used uh, over time. So the Mongolian or yellow race, including um, all East Asians and some Central Asians, the Malayan or brown race, including Southeast Asian and Pacific Islanders, the Ethiopian uh, or black race, um, Ethiopian standing uh, for burnt faces uh, in Greek, including Sub-Saharan Africans, um, and then the American or red race, including American Indians. You've also got Dr. Charles Caldwell, who uh, introduced phrenology, um, a pseudoscience which involves the measurement of bumps on the skull to produce mental traits. Dr. Caldwell argued African people's right place was slavery because their skull formation suggested less bumps, a natural timidity which required them to have masters. Um, this is really important because there were other such philosophies that, that evolved um, some years later that actually used this as the basis um, for their um, assertions uh, and or um, philosophies. So what's interesting to note is that Dr. Charles Caldwell was um, allowed to develop this philosophy uh, while studying at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so, so this was a philosophy that he um, is, was well known for, okay? Um, we've got Dr. John Van Every, who espouses in the mid 19th century that God has made the Negro an inferior being, not in most cases, but in all cases, uh, but all white men is equal, uh, responsible for Negroes and Negro slavery. We then go on to James Marion Sims, um, who's noted as the father of gynecology, who um, is pretty widely known now that he bought 11 uh, African-American women, black women, kept them in a laboratory and used them as experimental subjects to perfect surgical, a surgical technique, uh, which was used in correcting obstructive childbirth conditions for white women uh, called vesicle vaginal fistula, um, did not use anesthesia and rationalized it by stating that the procedures are not painful enough to justify the use of anesthesia. Uh, it's widely known also that he repeatedly operated on one of them, one of the women um, who was named Anarka, uh, over 30 times, not using any anesthesia. Um, he also experimented on more than 100 black babies, killing them um, using um, a shoe owl to correct for a problem which was termed trimus nascentium. Sims attributed the condition 
to the indecency and intellectual flaws of black slaves together, of, of black people, I'll just say it, together with, with skull malformations at birth. Sims attempted to treat this <clears throat> by trying to pry the bones and skulls uh, of the tiny infants into alignment with the use of a shoemaker's owl, pictured here. Um, it's also noted uh, that Sims um, was not only a notable figure in medical science at the time, but he became the president of the American Medical Association. So a pretty prominent figure here. Um, so here are uh, a few references, um, this book for midwives to medicine. I'm also um, really want to pay homage to Harry Medical so we've got the medical uh, doctors, and I've crossed that out, but medical terrorists, if you will, masked as um, doctors and academics, experts, um, intellectuals, and medical professionals um, who are in racial genocide through not only health education, but health care. Um, we go on to Samuel Cartwright. Uh, who says, it is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their minds. He's talking about African slaves, black and brown slaves, uh, that liberates their mind when under the control, when under the white man's control. Um, so it is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their minds when under the white man's control. And it is the want of sufficiency of red vital blood that changed their minds to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. So this is Dr. Cartwright who also studied at the University of Pennsylvania. He promoted the racial concept of disease that people from different races suffer from different diseases and experience common diseases differently. Um, I was looking at the movie The Help the other day and there's a character in there, um, I think her, the name is Hilly Holbrook and she, she is playing this character, someone in the 1960s uh, in Mississippi who, um, basically says, don't you know they carry different diseases? Um, and so that is a wide known belief um, amongst white people that has also been used to socialize um, other such groups, um, espoused even to black people, to African-Americans studying um, in the health field as well, um, and, and still commonly held. Um, he was known, uh, Dr. Cartwright was known as the expert in Negro medicine, uh, argued that slavery was beneficial for black people for medical reasons claimed that because black people um, had lower lung capacity than whites, uh, that forced labor was good for us. He created a, a device called the spirometer to support this particular theory uh, and demonstrate presumed deficiency in black people's lungs. Um, what's notable is that today, some doctors still uphold this claim, as I mentioned, um, and, and use um, modern day spirometers with race buttons on them. Um, called Correcting for Race. So it's really interesting to see how um, all of these things kind of come together. So he developed the theories of drapedomania and diastethia ethiopica. Drapedomania, um, which he referred to as the desire for enslaved uh, Black people to, to free themselves from slavery, was noted as a mental illness, um, and diastethia ethiopica as well, which um, he constituted as a lack of work ethic amongst African-Americans also labeled rascality um, that just kind of demotivated people um, not to work or to not have the desire to work, okay? Um, some of the prescriptions that he recommended uh, were to keep enslaved Negroes in submission in an infantile state. Um, he also recommended beatings and whippings. These were the prescriptions. Um, he studied, it, again, as I mentioned, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, an avid student of biblical scriptures relied heavily on Bible passages uh, and scriptures concerning enslavement. So some, um, I'll get share some of those in just a moment. But in this book, Draped the Mania, um, he states, uh, if the white man attempts to him a man by being cruel to him or punishing him in anger or by neglecting to protect him from the wanton abuses 
of his fellow servants and all others, or by denying him of the usual comforts and necessaries of life, the Negro will run away. But if he keeps him in the position that we learn from the scriptures, he was intended to occupy, that is, the position of submission. And if his master or overseer be kind and gracious in his hearing towards him without condescension and at the same time ministers to his physical wants and protects him from abuses, the Negro is spellbound and cannot run away. Um, he delivered uh, these medical findings before the Medical Association of Louisiana, um, and these were widely reprinted, right? So he was noted um, as the expert in Negro medicine. So some of the scriptures that he, uh, I suspect he referred to, and these are still there, are 1 Peter 2.18, which says, slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. 1 Timothy 6.1, which states, all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Colossians 3.22, slaves obey your earthly masters in everything you do, your earthly masters in everything you do, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor to not be beat, abused, raped, castrated, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Colossians 4.1, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you, you know that you also have a master in heaven. So he's speaking to white men, still there. Ephesians 6, 5, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. So all of these scriptures, um, the Bible in effect, written by white men to control um, non-white and white people, uh, but really prioritizing white people as superior, as, as these earthly figures to be not only esteemed, but um, adhered to, uh, obeyed, if you will, um, and, and really using that to um, influence medical philosophy and theory, right? Um, and, 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 and as, in essence, espousing anti-Blackness. It's very specific. Um, ta Dr. Thomas Roderick Drew, the 13th president of William and Mary College, um, who is a professor, history of metaphysics, protagonist of slavery, uh, believed and argued that enslaved Negroes were not fit for the condition of freedom. Um, you've also got Dr. Josiah Knott, who is the prominent figure in the 19th century, in the mid to kind of late 1800s, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, a professor of surgery, the founder of the Medical College of Alabama, credited with discovering transmission of yellow fever from mosquitoes, polygenism, uh, which was a, a play on phrenology, um, um, skull studies, which concluded each race had a different origin, um, argued that the skull formations of white people made them superior, and enslavement was the perfect condition for Negroes due to theirs, due to our skull formations. He's a graduate of the, of the University of Penn or studied there as well. Um, he also argued that Negroes were a creational rank between Greeks and chimpanzees in terms of intelligence, all right? Again, got a rep, the University of Pennsylvania and other such of, of these colonial colleges because they played a huge role in developing um, these individuals who um, continue to produce a racial or a purport and engineer racial genocide and racial harm. Um, so John uh, Lewis Agassiz was a biologist, zoologist, and geologist who became uh, a professor at Harvard. Uh, who also attended the university, who argued that black people were created along with other beasts and animals in the Garden of Eden, okay? Um, Sir Francis Galton, credited with being a statistician, sociologist, uh, physiologist, anthropologist, and eugenicist. So we now get into um, eugenics, uh, which was a word coined by, by Dr. Galton in 1883, um, a cousin of Charles Dar Darwin, to promote the ideal of perfecting the human race by, as he put it, getting rid of its undesirables while multiplying its desirables. And I think this is really um, a, a, a crucial point to drive home because in the 20th century, uh, before we start 
uh, reframing or recharacterizing black people as criminals, uh, even though like that's constituted throughout this entire time. Um, but there's a point in our history um, post the civil rights movement where it no longer is legal to discriminate against black people. So now we create um, and laws change to um, make people comfortable with the criminalization of people, of all people, even though black people are criminalized a lot more. But the reason that I say that, and I hope I didn't go on too much of a tangent, but before we get to that point, um, it's kind of made illegal in the early 20th century to not discriminate against black people in terms of housing. You get to the Supreme Court decision in 1917. But what you see um, is language that transforms. It's no longer Negroes or um, Asiatics per se, it's undesirables um, and or uh, nuisances. So that's some of the language transformation that you see around this time. So um, Charles Benedict Davenport, he was a prominent American biologist and eugenicist. Um, he was one of the American leaders of the uh, American eugenics movement. Uh, as quoted in the National Academy of Sciences biographical memoir of, of Charles Benedict Davenport. He says, I believe in striving to raise the human race uh, to the highest plane of social organization of cooperative work and effective endeavor. And so there's a lot that comes from this. So we've got um, him as a prominent figure. We've also got Madison Grant, um, who is a prominent eugenicist, a lawyer uh, and an anthropologist. He says, um, in his book, The Passing of the Great Race, um, that the races vary, into, vary intellectually and morally, just as they do physically. It has taken uh, 50 years uh, to learn that speaking English, wearing good clothes, and going to school uh, in church does not transform a Negro into a white man. So he also believed that Negroes were undesirable. And to really support this, uh, he developed a racial ladder, um, which he referred to where he classified pretty much uh, in a sequential order on the scale of um, value, sociological, mental, uh, physical, um, intellectual value, cultural value, um, Nordics who were at the top. Um, he then prioritized other such groups, um, creating toward the bottom of this ladder a category for non-Negroes, and then at the bottom were Black people, were Negroes. And so uh, we get to this um, era in the 20th century in, in the case of Buck v. Bell, which was a Virginia case that in 1924 that actually ended up before the Supreme Court in 1927, uh, where Carrie Buck was forced to undergo um, sterilization due to her being uh, feeble-minded, if you will. And so the Supreme Court uh, of 1927, a group of all white men, here we have it again, passed a decision um, that upheld, uh, they ruled that a state statute permitting compulsory sterilization of the unfit, including the intellectually disabled for the protection and health of the state, did not violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, so Carrie Buck, um, that's a picture of her and Emma Buck uh, pictured here. Um, but what you have is between 1929 and 1974 in North Carolina, North Carolina, um, over 7,000, 7,500 people were sterilized. 5,000 of those people were black. Out of those sterilized, 85% were women and girls, while 40% were minorities, most of them whom were black. In 1970, a total of 200,000 black women had been sterilized. By 1980, that number reached more than 700,000. The eugenics program, although it was eliminated in 1977, um, so it says um, there was legislation permitting involuntary sterilization of residents uh, that remained on the books um, in North Carolina uh, up until 2003. And so we've got this sterilization um, law uh, processes backed again uh, through academia, through religion, um, to perform these processes that detrimentally impact, impacted uh, black and brown women. It, it also impacted white women too, uh, predominantly women, some men as well, 
um, but it impacted black women extraordinarily in proportion. Uh, we've, we see things, um, and I think this is just kind of the last example that I'll share, uh, which most people are familiar with, but the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment, um, which was um, a United States public health um, initiative, which promised free medical care to um, more than 600 African-American men who suffered from syphilis, secretly withheld treatment um, and waited for the deaths of these men to perform autopsies. Uh, researchers wanted to confirm hypothesis that it damaged neurological systems of whites while bypassing blacks underdeveloped brains, instead damaging the cardiovascular system. Um, so these experiments and these, um, this experiment or, or, or um, practice, if you will, was in place uh, for 40 years uh, and lasted until 1972. Um, so again, we've got medical professionals, um, healthcare experts, um, health education experts, uh, philosophers, uh, highly credentialed uh, people who are noted as um, highly qualified experts to de design, develop, purport these philosophies um, that supported and were, were really worked for the, the benefit and the advantage of white people um, across the board, but also were designed and developed to harm, kill, murder, um, and commit genocide, of, of racial genocide of black and brown people, particularly black people, um, as we were the guinea, guinea pigs um, in most of these um, experiments. So a few questions that I'll end with um, is what comes to mind for you in terms of considering the ways uh, in which health abuse disguised as health care and racial genocide disguised as health education have contributed to the demise of African-American communities, also leading to the distrust maintained by African-Americans today. So I'm going to um, go to this. Activate this. And I'll ask you to respond here. So again, what comes to mind for you in terms of considering the ways in which health, health abuse and racial genocide disguised as health care, health education, have contributed to the demise of African-American communities, leading to distrust made by Black people uh, today, even today and, and throughout our history? I'll give you a few minutes to respond. Yes. So vaccine hesitancy, absolutely, absolutely. I don't, I don't even get the, the flu shot. I don't think I'll be getting the coronavirus shot. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, I know for myself and members of my family, we literally do not go to the doctor unless we have to. So annihilation, alienation, demoralizing, just pain, just plain awful, race-based screening. Yep, I feel a visceral disgust, particularly about the forced sterilization, did not know it affected 700,000 black women. Uh, access to prevention, uh, Henrietta Lacks. Yep, stress-related metabolic disorders. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Doctors not taking um, pregnant black women seriously and directly causing their deaths through negligence. Uh, poor provider interactions. Most definitely, because we're socialized to like not treat black people well in any context, to not have to respect them. So, and I, I could share with you a recent experience that I went through, which was horrible, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just not there. And, and so even the decisions that are being made for Black people are not well thought through. There's not as much care taken. Um, labeled as non-compliant. Yep, it's all our fault. Um, statistics that are quite uh, recent related to residents not, why is this not scrolling down? 
wish I could see more of these answers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th there, there is a lot here. I'm gonna go to another uh, poll and I'm gonna present this one. And I wanna ask you, um, and I want all of you who are paying attention right now to uh, respond to this. So if you were black, um, what would your trust level be in the healthcare system, in medical professionals, in doctors? Would it be low, you know, maybe one to five, uh, six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20? How much trust would you have in a system that was designed, so someone said C, wow, <laughs> someone said uh, six to 10, right? Um, designed through laws that influenced institutions, particularly religious and academic institutions um, that allowed individuals to develop and construct these philosophies that are still widely held and widely known and, and widely used um, in our culture today to treat um, black and brown people. So if you were black, um, what would your level of trust be? So I see, um, I can leave this up for just a little while longer. So some people said, well, they would still maintain some trust because maybe they would wanna go to the doctor. Um, I know for myself, looking at these options, E. And for most people I know, um, it would be E. Um, there, there's just no trust. There's a lot of distrust and fear. There's anger. Um, and I've had people who are close to me, my grandmother and other people um, who were not only mistreated when they went to the hospital, but, um, you know, it's my estimation and my family's opinion that things were done that ended my grandmother's life early, that um, could have been done differently. That, um, and, and it's the truth for the way my father was treated when he was in the hospital several years ago. Um, and I tried to advocate him, just a lot of negligence um, and not people who, um, involved in the profession who are trained to be guided or to understand that they must treat all patients well. Um, there's just a lack of regard, a lack of respect, and a total, an utterly blatant disregard for Black people um, in healthcare, and that has been maintained um, for centuries, as I tried to uh, share with you here today. So hopefully this, um, was useful. Um, like I said, it's it's from a curriculum that I have that focuses on a, a combination of how racism impacted and has functioned throughout all of our institutions. And I did my best to try and run through a series of examples uh, through, this, through this presentation today. So I hope it was really helpful. And thank you all um, for devoting your time to uh, these sessions. And I can't wait to be back with you again. All right. Thank you so much, Dante. And I believe that Melissa has posted into the chat that uh, because of the wealth of the content, the opportunity, the need to process, we wanted to give you the full uh, webinar hour to go through the content, uh, but we will be transitioning over to a separate Zoom meeting because this is a webinar Zoom, and so we are not able to see and connect with one another. So we will start the post-discussion chat in a separate Zoom meeting and y'all can register at the link. Uh, but we also recognize that some people do need to depart uh, on the hour. Uh, so once again, thank you so much, Dante, for uh, again, sharing your wisdom and your gift, uh, particularly around the emphasis around the ways in which historical racism at the intersections of health um, and academia continue to show up in our work today and the legacy of that and that history. 
Um, so thank you so much. Appreciate all of your attendance. And we will be curating down these recordings. So uh, for our audience who is wondering, will this be made available? Uh, yes, give us a couple of weeks and we will post that up to the Office of Diversity and Outreach website and you can find the first and second installments already there. So thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to um, Ben uh, for any uh, closeouts. I have nothing. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to be headed over to uh, the post-discussion chat.